There's a war raging right now. It's easily a hundred years old. And it's a war for this word, melash. Whenever the Greeks described the skin color of the ancient Egyptians, they often used the term melash or derivatives such as melanas, melancroes, and melain. You've guessed it. It's where we get the word melanin. But what does it mean? At its simplest, the word meant black. Well, that was until very recently. In the last hundred years, revisionists have been desperately working to repurpose this word as meaning dark-skinned or swarthy. This rewriting of history doesn't take much to debunk. You can start with the fact that there's a good reason North Africa is today often informally referred to as White Africa. Now, commonsensically, the ancient Greeks were not making voyages to so-called White Africa and wasting all that expensive ancient ink just to describe people slightly tanner than themselves as melash, one of the strongest terms in their vocabulary for all things black. Then there's the simple fact that the word melas and its multiple variations has historically been translated as black and by some of the most respected traditional sources. The very first Egyptologists and classicists, with all their scholarship and devotion to classical arts and languages, and despite their bias against black Africa, translated melas and its derivatives as meaning black or blackened. Here's an easy experiment. You do a search using something called Strong's Concordance for the amount of times the Greek word melas is used in the King James Bible's New Testament. Without exception, you will find it translated into English as black. But even more telling, you'll find some of the same translators who recently begun to pretend the term merely means swarthy, translating melas or melancroes in other places simply as black. They are caught doing this again and again, and not just in the Greek language, but also with Latin equivalents. My friend Kueli Mika on his channel has done a great expose of the Greek examples of this intellectual dishonesty. As for Latin equivalents, we've caught them red-handed too. You have to watch to the end of this video to see just how. But first, there's another popular argument the deniers of Black Egypt like to use, and it's that a different word was always used by the ancients to describe real Black Africans, that word being Ethiopian. If you hear someone using this talking point, run. They are ignorant and most likely have borrowed their supposed knowledge from a toxic comment board on Quora. In reality, you'll find many examples in the ancient record that prove them wrong. Let's take just one. Ezekiel the Tragedian was a Greco-Jewish poet, writing sometime between 300 to 200 BC. In his play, Exegog, Moses' wife, Sipora, tells another character where she's from. She says this, quote, Stranger, this land is called Libya. It is inhabited by tribes of various peoples, Ethiopians, black men, close quote. Libyans were black? Yeah, I caught that too. That's another video. Just hit subscribe and stay tuned. For now, the word Sipora uses for black hair is Melanas. This demonstrates the Greeks had no problem using this term to describe the Ethiopians as well as other black-skinned peoples such as the ancient Egyptians. The Greek word Ethiopian itself, though it literally translated to of burnt face, was more a political designation for the general mass of African nations living mostly south of Egypt, of whom the Greeks knew much less about. Right, I'll stop teasing. Let's look at what the Greeks and the Romans actually had to say about the ancient Egyptians. Quote, the Egyptians said that they believed the Colchians to be descended from the army of Sesostris. My own conjectures were founded first on the fact that they are black-skinned and have woolly hair, which certainly amounts to but little, since several other nations are so too. Close quote. If you're wondering who the Colchians Herodotus referred to were, wonder no more. Because in our video, Pharaoh's Forgotten Warriors, 
we proved from the historical record that whatever else can be said about them, the Colchians Herodotus spoke of were indeed a black people. Now you are not going to the continent of Africa, I repeat, not going to the continent of Africa and describing the people you see there as black-skinned and woolly-haired, when all along what you intend to describe is this. But say for some reason you do, I don't know, maybe Herodotus had bad eyesight. You've now just used up the adjectives black-skinned and woolly hair to describe someone like Rami Malek. How then would you describe this type of person? Well, this is the kind of gaslighting logic supposedly woke modern academia is still engaging in. Truth is, the Greeks knew exactly what they were describing. And Diodorus Siculus, writing sometime between 60 to 30 BC, describes some of the other peoples living along the Nile in almost exactly the same terms as Herodotus. Listen. Quote, but there are also a great many other tribes of the Ethiopians. Some of them, and especially those who dwell along the Nile River, are black in color and have flat noses and woolly hair. The Greek word for black there is melanes, and there can be no doubt Diodorus is describing black people here. Notice also that like Herodotus, Diodorus describes the Nile Valley blacks as having woolly hair. Herodotus uses the word ulotrikes, coming from the root word ulotrix, meaning crisp, curly or kinky hair, whereas Diodorus uses the term uloi. And that term uloi, according to Liddell, Scott, Jones's ancient Greek lexicon, means woolly of thick fleecy wool or crisp or close curling hair. It's almost as if the ancient Greeks knew certain people would twist their words thousands of years in the future. So, they decided to be as specific in their description as possible. But wait, they get even more specific. Lucian of Samosata was a Greek-educated Syrian poet. This is how he describes an Egyptian man in his play, The Wishes. Quote, As for this fellow, to say nothing of his black skin, and protruding lips and spindle shanks, his words came tumbling out in a heap, one on the top of another. It was Greek, of course, but the voice, the accent, were Egyptian born. Close quote. The revisionist translation I'm using here has also changed the word black uh, to mean dark, but too bad for translators Fowler and Fowler because Lucian of Samosata doesn't leave things to be decided by their biased rendering. Lucian adds to his description of the Egyptian man that he had, quote, protruding lips and spindle shanks. Now, I wonder what type of a human being a white Greek would be looking at and describing as black with protruding lips. Hmm. If you're wondering what Lucian meant by spindle shanks, He's referring to the Egyptian man's long, thin legs or calves. Now for me, this was case closed. Why? Story time. See, Mrs. Tro Black is not actually black herself. She doesn't have to be, for behold, nary a blacker white woman did ever God create. Eminem, Rachel Dolezal, please sit down. Anyway, one of the first things Madam Tro Black mentioned to me about the differences between black and white men is that blacks tend to have thinner, almost stick-like lower legs than the average white person. You could say spindlier legs. This disparity gets more extreme the more easternly one travels in Africa, particularly in places like modern-day Sudan, Ethiopia and Kenya. Check out this more scientific look at the issue in this Guardian article. I've put the link below. The things women notice, right? Lucian of Samosata was simply noticing another physiological difference that proved the typical ancient Egyptian was a black African. But someone else who makes this same observation is poet Achilles Titus in his story The Loves of Cleitophon and Lucip. Listen to how he describes a gang of Egyptian men. The place was full of terrifying savage men, all tall, dark colored, yet not absolutely black like an Indian, but more like a bastard Ethiopian. 
with shaven heads, small feet, and gross bodies. Close quote. Again, Steve Gasly, who translates this, does the dishonest thing of using dark colored instead of using the word black. We know Titus meant black and not dark colored because he only uses the word once in this part of the sentence. He actually doesn't use melanes or any other variation of the word twice here. Literally translated, he just says akraton, which means absolutely or completely. Here, let me put the sentence in a better way. Quote, the place was full of savage men, all tall, black, not completely like an Indian, but more like a bastard Ethiopian. Close quote. See that? He doesn't need to use the word black twice when he's already used it. Also, the word gross there doesn't mean disgusting. Stephen Gasly is translating the word large or stout in an old-fashioned sense. And more accurately again, the translation for small feet there is thin legs. You don't have to trust me on that. This is what happens when you put the particular phrase Gasly translates as small feet into Google Translator. See? Again, thin legs. Otherwise, small feet doesn't make sense as a description, not unless Titus had some sort of foot fetish. Finally, notice Achilles Titus makes the point of saying these men aren't blue-black like Dravidian Indians, but black like the brown-tinged blacks of Africa or Ethiopia, who tend towards Mocha more than their Dravidian counterparts. But even that isn't strictly speaking true, as Dravidians themselves can have a browner tinge. Look at these. Point is, you'd have to be stretching reality pretty thin there to pretend Achilles Titus is trying to describe modern-day Middle Eastern or Coptic Egyptians. The Suppliance by Aeschylus is a play about a group of women escaping a forced marriage to Egyptian royalty. And in one scene, an Egyptian fleet is rowing up to Argos where the women have taken refuge. You won't believe how they're described. Quote, I see the shipmen there. They catch the light with such black limbs against their robes of white. Close quote. Now, why would Aeschylus call people who supposedly look like modern day Egyptians a people who at the very most can be said to be half a shade darker than the typical ancient Greek. Why would he say such people had black limbs? And this is an even more modern translation I'm using by Gilbert Murray, an Oxford professor who died in the late 1950s. In other translations such as Edmund Morseheads, in the lead up to the describing of the Egyptian sailors, the sentence is made to read and look, the seamen, their race all too plain. Now if a Greek character narrating could see black limbs from a shore in the distance and said of them, their race is all too plain, you can't be helped if you believe he was talking about a boat carrying a load of Gerard Butlers or Yul Brynner or whoever this guy is. Funny, we never heard any complaints from the modern Egyptian media when these films came out. Anyway, let's go back to Herodotus and nail this coffin shut. Herodotus is relaying a story about the origin of some religious oracles in Phoenicia and he claims that the story told to him about their origin concerns Egyptian priestesses who would turn themselves into talking doves. Here's what he says about these doves. Quote, the tale that the dove was black signifies that the woman was Egyptian. Close quote. Let me repeat that. The tale that the dove was black signifies that the woman was Egyptian. There isn't even a doubt in Herodotus' mind about the meaning of the myth told to him. He says he takes it for granted that the story indicates the ethnicity of the women who morphed into doves just by the fact that the doves were black in colour. This is how much of a basic assumption it was to the ancient Greeks that if you were Egyptian, you were typically black. Now, if you want to play word games, go ahead and change George Rawlinson's translation so that it reads Dark Dove, whatever that means. 
The facts are there for anybody without an agenda to see. If you lived in ancient Greece and somebody said the word Egyptian, a Middle Eastern face did not come to mind. A black man's did. In all its glorious shades of, yes, black. And with many of the stereotypical accoutrements that come with being black. Kinky hair, full lips, athletic legs, and so on. Now my friends, if you've got this far in the video and you're still paying attention, then here's your prize. Meet John Carew Rolfe, a classicist and supposed expert from the 1800s. He translated many classical texts for something called Liebes Library. For this video, we're interested in his work on translating Ammianus Marcellinus's Rerum Gestarum, specifically this quote. Now the men of Egypt are as a rule somewhat swarthy and dark of complexion." Close quote. The word Mr. Rolf chooses to translate as dark-skinned is Latin and is the word Atrati. But take Rolf's translation of something else called the Attic Nights by Roman writer Aulus Cornelius Gellius. It just so happens that Gellius was someone with an OCD for words and their proper meanings. Wikipedia calls him a grammarian basically a grammar Nazi. In book two of his Attic Nights, he's riffing about the origin and meaning of different Latin words. And eventually, you won't believe it, he comes to this word, black. This is how Mr. Rolf translates Gellius' words. Fur is so called because the early Romans used fervus for atar, black, and thieves steal most easily in the night, which is black. Close quote. It's just dawned on me. Furtive. Furtive meaning to creep around. Probably associated with the fact that thieves creep around at night time. That's what Gellius is talking about here. Fur. Uh, this is amazing. Anyway. Gellius is explaining the link between the word black, ater or atra in Latin and fervus meaning fur which early Romans used to mean black. Here's how Google Translate to translate atra as at the time of making this video. Here's atra, black again, and here's atrati as blackened. That atrati is what Ammianus Marcellinus calls the Egyptians. He calls them black, or you might say blackish or blackened. Now both Gellius's Attic Nights and Marcellinus's Rerum Gestarum were translated for Liebes Library by the late Mr. Rolf. They say it's wrong to speak ill of the dead. True. Much better to let the work they leave behind do that. Last but not least, it's important to point out that the ancient Greeks had a high regard for the black civilizations that preceded their own. They spoke of the Ethiopians as the first of all men and they almost always took it for granted that the Egyptian people, their culture, religion, art, and science emerged from deeper within Africa and was not Levantine in origin. From Diodorus Siculus, quote, They say also that the Egyptians are colonists sent out by the Ethiopians, Osiris having been the leader of the colony. The larger part of the customs of the Egyptians are, they hold, Ethiopian the colonists still preserving their ancient manners." End quote. Diodorus gives many examples of these ancient manners, but get this, he even takes it for granted that the hieroglyphic writing system is Ethiopian in origin. We must now speak, he says, about the Ethiopian writing which is called hieroglyphic among the Egyptians. Quote, For of the two kinds of writing which the Egyptians have, that which is known as popular, Demotic is learned by everyone, while that which is called sacred is understood only by the priests of the Egyptians. But among the Ethiopians, everyone uses these forms of letters. Many other things are also told by them concerning their own antiquity and the colony which they sent out that became the Egyptians. But about this, there is no special need of our writing anything. Close quote. I think Diodorus had it right in that last sentence, don't you guys? Let me know in the comments section. I mean, there's really no need to prove something that's as plain as the nose on our faces. It's like NewTube06 said in our last video. 
People will believe what they want to believe, despite the evidence smacking them in the face. So why do we do it? Well, we do it for our children and their children's children, so that they aren't made to believe the lies that their fathers and mothers spent years on learning, that they had no history. Support our work, guys. Buy a shirt at trillblack.myshopify.com and rep black right. No doubt.